All right, guys, welcome back to Downtown Rams. As always, I'm your host, Alexis Kraft. Join here with my co-host, Jake Allen Bogan. And we are coming to you with our 2023 Rams NFL Draft recap episode. Uh, a lot of you guys joined us for our three-day live stream where I looked much like I do now, disheveled uh, and running on very little sleep, as with was Jake. That's kind of our thing every year is we don't sleep the entire NFL draft and we give coverage the whole time. Uh, and it's very fun, but it is very taxing, Jake. I know towards the end, like the last, like the seventh round, I'm, I, I black out. I don't even remember what's going on. I'm just like in the pick is next in the pick is. And yeah. later it kind of like comes back to me like a fever dream where then I start to remember everybody that was taken in the seventh round and I can think more clearly, but we are, it's been about a week now, six days since the draft ended. Um, I, I, we would have dropped this sooner, but quite honestly, guys, I had like the craziest week ever and I was very slammed and I wanted to make sure I had the time to watch these guys again and kind of see what the what people said about them and, you know, make opinions and see what people are saying before we did this episode. So we're we're recording this now on Friday night and this will probably come out tomorrow. Um, but Jake, are you ready to dive into the Rams picks? Yeah. I mean, you know, we we spent a lot of time throughout the draft and I mean, I I, <laughs> I think you you can tell. I mean, I'm pretty beat, but you know, it's just the grind oh, does not it. stop. If people are watching this on YouTube. I like I look like I just like somehow ran a marathon when I haven't done any physical activity today. It's just my <laughs> overall appearance and demeanor is I am just like cooked like i am spent i we're both very tired um yes but we have we have the energy to at least talk about the rams draft picks even though there were many this is the most picks that uh, the rams have made jake since you and i have been covering the draft together and i don't know this off the top of my head but i should have looked this up is this the most picks the rams have ever made in a draft class because it I, feels like it. yeah i believe so i mean yeah 14 yeah, it's that that's a yeah. lot. I mean, that's doubling what they give you. So, right. Yeah, it's quite a bit. Um, so we're going to do our best to go through them. And the way that Jake and I are going to do this is we're just going to kind of take turns. Um, maybe Jake will go first for one pick and then I'll go first for the next. And we'll just kind of, you know, give our overall analysis uh, of the pick, you know, the, the pros, the cons, if we think, you know, there are any. Um, I know when I was making my notes for this episode, Jake, I just I wrote down as well kind of what other people were saying about him, like other scouting reports, because I don't want to just act like my analysis is end all be all <laughs> for each pick. So I'm going to do my best to just kind of give like a general consensus on each pick, um, which the, the truth is, and Jake knows this as well as I do, is like none of this, what matters is when they get on the field, right? But this is just us now analyzing the picks and value. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, <clears throat> we we could talk about, like I think you and I were, were talking about how the Steelers, you know, had like an A-plus grade, right? And I mean, I've given, you know, the Rams a, a hefty grade that we'll get into, but um, at the end of the day, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter if they're not showing out on the field, you know, and I think that's, that's a big deal. Um, you know, winning draft night doesn't always mean, you know, you, you, you got a bunch of hall of famers doesn't even mean you got a bunch of pro bowlers, you know, um, it, it's a matter of that next step and how these guys, you know, because we've seen the most can't miss prospects, just not be able to work out in the NFL. So nothing is, is ever guaranteed. And I think that's, um, you know, the hard truth and Alexis, I'll say this, I was going through my rankings, uh, those graphics I used to make. And even before we started, uh, working together, I was looking at my other rankings. Cause I think those, those are kind of science sealed delivered. It's been more than three years. I think it's fair to kind of grade and judge, you know, based on that. And I, I gotta tell you, you know, I have some serious hits and then I have some flat out misses, some flat out whiffs. And so I think that's kind of, like the nature of the NFL draft, it's almost like a 50 50 thing. You know, pick number one might be a superstar, pick number two might be a bust, three might be good, four might be bad. Like, it's it's really fascinating when I was going through and looking at it. 
just how many guys, you know, end up being really good and how many guys end up being just not so good. So yeah, well, nothing's guaranteed. The good news for the Rams is they have 14 picks. So the odds that more than one of them will be successful in the NFL pretty high. is pretty high, which is good for them uh, and good for us as Rams fans. So the odds are in our favor in terms of yes. this being a successful class. Uh, so Jake, let's kick it off. We'll go in order and order the picks. So we'll start. I'll let you go first with our second round pick. Yes. So the first pick of the Rams draft in the second round, 36th overall, they selected uh, TCU guard Steve Avila, former center, moved to guard. And I love this pick because I feel like right off the rip, you're getting a guy that's NFL ready. You're getting a guy that's going to, you know, come in and, and really be able to protect Matthew Stafford. Didn't give up, in, you know, any sort of uh, sack last year. Um, over 900 plus snaps, he only gave up one sack. And this is somebody that helps you in the run game. You know, he's a really nice wide base, so he can really uh, stand hold, you know, hold his ground and and really, you know, show his ability to anchor. Um, you know, because you'll have stronger defense alignment that'll try to bull rush him, and he'll be able to plant that anchor and really, you know, keep himself in the same spot. And he's really a wall. So for an offensive line that you know struggled the way it did, Alexis, I feel like this is definitely an important pick here. Uh, because it's right off the bat. It, I told you uh, during the draft, it surprised me. I did not think they were going to go offensive line that early. It didn't sound like they were. And, um, you know, he was the number one guy when they reset their board on uh, Friday night or for Friday night. He was their number one guy. So uh, we we found out afterwards all the different reports of how, you know, the offensive line coach, uh, you know, Ryan Wendell was, was waiting essentially like, you know, impatiently and, you know, the Raiders traded up to, you know, just in front of the Rams, assuming that the Rams might want to go after uh, your guy, Michael Mayer, uh, because they had, you know, a, initially had interest in a tight end. And so I think this was a huge pick for the Rams to get started. You get a plug and play day one guard. You get a guy now uh, back to back drafts. You've started off your drafts getting guards. So the hope is that both he and Logan Bruss can play. And now you have two potential franchise guards on your offensive line and both guards that, you know, can are pretty versatile in their own right. You look at Steve Avila, he can play center and I think he could play right tackle in a pinch. I wouldn't play him there, but he could, uh, when you look at Bruss, he played tackle, he played guard. So a lot of positional versatility for the Rams and, uh, you know, they're getting, you know, younger, even though he's a little bit of an older pick, but they're getting younger here and they're, they're getting stronger in the interior. And I think that's, uh, what anybody would sign up for. Yeah, I um I really wanted the Rams to go offensive line in the second round. Um, I pretty much have the past several years have always been saying that I want offensive line with the first pick, and it has never happened. Uh, well, I guess I guess it has, but we haven't taken an offensive lineman this high. But I didn't think it was going to happen. Kind of as you said, it didn't seem that this is the direction the Rams were going to go in the second round. So I kind of put that aside. I did think they were going to go defense, but I absolutely. Loved this pick. Um, probably my favorite pick in the drafts. Um, I think for most Rams fans, this has probably been our favorite pick just because we saw what happened last year with the offensive line, um, which was very bad. And even in the seasons leading up to last year, like it wasn't great. I don't think the Rams have had a super um, outstanding offensive line for a while personally. So I think that we're now heading in that direction, hopefully. So it was really exciting to see this pick. My interpretation of Steve is I wrote down run game God. Um, he is very good in the run game. I think that, um, you know, a word that has been used by several people is Mahler. I think you also use that word uh, when we were doing our draft stream. He's just like a nasty offensive lineman, which I love. I think that it's very going to be very helpful uh, for our running backs, especially to have Steve in there. Um, he has great size. He's 6'3", 332 pounds, uh, which is amazing. Um, just great size. Um, another thing that I, a lot of people think really helps him out is his experience. He was a redshirt senior, so he's played a while. And when you're looking at NFL draft prospects, um, a lot of teams – 
even though they're slightly older, a lot of teams do like players that have the experience of playing multiple years in college. Um, just because, you know, attitude wise, uh, as well as you've seen it all during the games, the longer that you've played. Um, so yeah, I think really good. And then my last note on him was the versatility. He's played left guard and center. Um, I mean, like you said, I, I probably won't play him like at tackle, but like in a pinch, I'm sure he'd be better <laughs> than others, uh, yeah. just because of his size and he's proven to be versatile, but yeah, home run pick in my opinion by the Rams. Yeah. And it's one of those safe picks, you know, um, you it's like batting a thousand like you just you know it's gonna work and I mean I know that kind of goes against what I was saying earlier but he has just such a safe floor I would say because you know his floor is essentially plug and play starting guard in the NFL and his ceiling in my opinion is all pro I compared him to um you know a guard on the you know Cleveland Browns uh I don't know if if you remember you know when he came out but uh Joel Batonio he just, he reminds me of Batonio. Um, I feel like he's got that feistiness, that nastiness. He can work in pass pro. He can get down, get to the second level combo block. Um, you know, that's just the type of guy that you want on your offensive line. And I mean, let's look at it like this, you know, right off the rip, pick 36. I mean, we talked about it. I, you know, I've mentioned it before. Guys that haven't been picked at 36. You look at Debo Samuel, you look at uh, Brees Hall, you know, Xavier McKinney, Javon Holland, uh, Miles Jack, you know, those are just guys off the top of my head, but there have been a lot of really good picks at 36. So really there's a trend here that 36 is just where you find good football players. It's worked out for teams. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, to start your, you know, draft class that, at this point, we only knew that they had 11 picks because they didn't even make a trade here. So to start your draft class off with 11 picks and to pick a guy who immediately fills a hole, he addresses a problem that the Rams had last year in protecting the quarterback and helps the run game. You know, this this is a plus definitely for, uh, you know, for Steve Avila and the Rams. I think it's a great fit for him. I think it's great for the Rams. And I think it's great for Stafford and Cam Akers and so forth. I agree. So my grade on that pick is a plus. Is that, I assume that that is also your grade. Yeah. I mean, I'm probably not going to go through and like grade all the picks, but okay. I just felt like right off the rip. That was, that was an a plus for me. Do you want to just give our final grade at the end? Yeah. Yeah. That's probably okay. better just cause I don't want to hear it when like, Oh, well you graded him this on, you know, another, well, th- yeah, I don't want to hear we're it. Gonna, <laughs> we're going to hear it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Too yeah. late for me. Um, all right. Yeah. Your, so, your fate is sealed. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So n- next pick round three, uh, was Byron young from Tennessee. I have to clear that up because there were two Byron Youngs in the drafts. uh, And there, of course, as we could have expected, there was a mishap when the Raiders drafted Byron Young out of Alabama. They were reporting it as it was Byron Young out of Tennessee. So we thought he was already off the board. Then it got corrected. And then everybody was confused at what was going on. And then we realized Byron Young from Alabama went to the Raiders. Byron Young from Tennessee went to the Rams. So Very confusing. Byron Young from Tennessee is who we're talking about. Um, So the best part I think about him, obviously, is his story. How, um, and I don't want to butcher this, you know it better than I do, but he was posting the videos basically during COVID, was able to get an offer at Tennessee and kind of exploded out of nowhere, um, essentially. Yeah, Dollar General too. Yeah, working at Dollar General. So Byron Young... Um, the first thing that I think that really stands out about him is just, he's an athletic specimen, just the way that he's built. I mean, 6'3", 250 pounds, 4.4340, just 90, oh, 97th percentile, uh, in the vertical, by the way. Um, That's ridiculous. Just absolutely ridiculous. Um, he had 16 sacks in two years playing in the SEC. So he only played for two years in the SEC, and he had 16 sacks. Um, He's very, very quick off the edge, high motor, great leverage. The biggest knock against him that I've found when I'm reading these scouting reports is a lot of scouts were concerned that he only played two years, uh, which I didn't understand because he had very good stats in the two years that he played, um, and that he's 25 years old, which I can kind of understand, but um, whatever. 
Um, I think the biggest thing with Byron is potential because he, you know, is lacking in experience. Um, I think that this is really a potential pick. Um, I think he was drafted kind of maybe a little higher than some thought he would. I thought that he would be drafted in the third round, but I think for the potential that you can get out of Byron Young, um, it's totally worth the pick because like I said, you have all those amazing athletic qualities. Yes. Maybe a little inexperienced, you know, fine, but I don't, I think that he's proven that that doesn't really matter when you look at his skill set. Yeah. I think when you look at Byron Young, this is just somebody that exemplifies going through adversity head on and, you know, going from dollar general assistant manager to then going to this Juco school, having, you know, this, these highlights come out about you because there were, they were filming the practices because COVID canceled the games, but they're still practicing. And, you know, he gets all these offers from the SEC, but one thing that stands out to me there. He's offered first by Tennessee. So that's why he decided to go there. He wanted to go with the first school that offered him. That's one thing I love. Second thing, now obviously the story. The the second thing here, he just took number zero. Now, I know it's just a number, but I feel like, again, it exemplifies who he is as a person. There's never been a number zero in the history of Rams football. There's been a double zero in, in 1947. But there's never been a number zero. So there's no overshadowing. There's no following a path. This guy's a trailblazer. He's creating his own path. You know, I've said he's like the edge version of Kurt Warner. But I mean, Kurt Warner went undrafted. And that's not really a fair comparison. But it kind of gives you an idea like Kurt Warner working at a high V. And then, you know, just having to go a different route than just going straight to the NFL. With Byron Young, he was drafted in the third. Let's make no mistake about it. But the fact of the matter is that he went from, you know, Dollar General, Juco, Tennessee, and to the Rams. He's going to wear number zero. He's going to, you know, blaze his own trail. He's going to create his own path. And I don't know that. I just think that's really interesting. Now, when you look at him as a football player, if you want to get picky, you know, I think, yes, he's an absolute freak off the edge. He's got serious juice. That 4-4 speed is going to be great. Um, you know, he can get sideline to sideline if he needs to can chase down guys can make tackles. I understand there's a lot of issues with him in the run game that scouts have. I think it's more of the nuance and just the overall technique. Maybe it could be better, um, you know, bigger, you know, offensive lineman might swallow him up in the run game. But I think at the end of the day, he's going to the NFL. He's going to work on that. And I believe that when you look at Byron Young, this is somebody that has a chance to be really good, like really good. I think that they got a guy who may not have been the first choice on other people's boards, but they did enough homework on him. They know he fits what they're looking for. And at the end of the, at the, end of the day, I want guys that are going to be leaders on my team. I want to draft guys that, you know, have like a lead by example approach. And I feel like he's just going to be a leader day one, you know, even though he's a rookie, right? 25 years old. Yes, okay, that that might be a little bit of an issue for some, but the Rams don't look at it that way. And it kind of goes back to why I've been saying, like, at the end of the day, I don't think that the Rams have been trying to tank. And I think this draft showed it, Alexis, because if they're trying to tank, they wouldn't have gone out and got high floor, ready to play right away players. They probably would have gone after high ceiling, not ready to play, and just thrown them into the fire. And that is not what Byron Young is. He is a high floor guy who can help you right away. Now... In order for him to reach his full potential, Alexis, he does need to improve his pass rush plan. What I mean by that is he doesn't have a lot of counters. You know, he really doesn't counter. He's just going to try to use speed. He's just going to try to go around, you know, and, and make plays that way. Um, you know, and just be kind of a straight line, you know, rusher. But at the end of the day, I think that when you get to the NFL, you can work on that. I think being in the same room as guys like Aaron Donald is really going to help him out. And uh, I trust him because I think this guy has already shown that he he's willing to work as hard as anybody else. And if he develops that, you know, pass rush toolbox and the, the overall plan and really, uh, you know, picks his, his spots, I think he can be a really dominant edge defender and edge rusher uh, in the NFL. The next pick um, I'll let you go first with this was Kobe Turner. 
defensive tackle out of Wake Forest uh, in the third round, 89th overall. Yeah, so with with Kobe Turner, it's interesting because they they absolutely love him. Um, you, you talk about his just overall football IQ, how smart he is, how he makes plays. He he plays through the whistle, uh, maybe even a little bit after the whistle. Um, but this is somebody that, you know, is coming to this team that they need something like that. They lost Greg Gaines. They lost a Sean Robinson. Kobe Turner is probably going to fit right in there. Alexis, the first three picks might be three day one starters, and that's not unheard of. Um, and it's not, it shouldn't surprise anybody, you know, with where the what position they're in. So, <clears throat> you know, I think when you look at Kobe Turner, just a really intelligent football player at the end of the day, that uh, is a good athlete and he's a little undersized. I always use those air quotes because I don't know why we're still doing the whole undersized thing with defensive linemen. I thought Aaron Donald, you know, uh, taught everybody a lesson. I guess not. Um, but he's going to get a chance to learn from Aaron Donald. And I, re- at the end of the day, I really trust any interior defense lineman that's going to get that opportunity to work behind Aaron Donald, see his process and what he goes through. I will say this. I think that when you look at Kobe Turner, I may have had a higher grade on Adebare, but Kobe Turner can end up being a better prospect just because of the fact that, you know, who he's in the building with. And I think Henderson's going to get him in, going to look under the hood, see what he needs to work on. And they're going to figure it out. And this feels like the John Johnson pick all over again, where maybe there were some other guys there that I would have preferred. Like when the Rams picked John Johnson, I want Desmond King, but you know, doesn't mean King was a bad player. It's just John Johnson did work out. And I think Turner's going to work out in LA. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, if you guys were watching our live stream, we both really wanted um, Ed Tomiwa and Abare from Northwestern. And we were kind of, I think, puzzled with this pick um, of Kobe Turner. And the thing with Kobe Turner, you know, when you look at him, um, you know, the positive. So I also had an air quotes undersized. And then I wrote, <laughs> where have we heard that before? Question mark. Um, because it's just absolutely ridiculous. You know, I think Aaron Donald should have like crushed that narrative uh, by now, but it is still out there. So um, although he is, quote unquote, undersized, um, he is really quick to shed blockers, high motor, great hands. Those are things that people um, like about him. Um, I think that where it starts to get kind of like questionable. So he he never actually started at Wake Forest but he had 43 and a half tackles for loss in his college career. So he did put up impressive stats, but he did never start. Part of that could be what you and I were saying uh, during the live stream um, is like, he kind of gives off the vibe sometimes as more of like a rotational feel. Um, And that's what he was in college. Now, can he shed that narrative? Yes. That doesn't mean, you know, very more times than not like college like these prospects don't end up being what they were in college like just because you had a role in college doesn't mean you're gonna have an NFL so I think the Rams because of how high they took him they don't see him as a rotational player so you know I think that that's not their long-term goal so we'll see I think he's got a lot of upside I think it's a very similar thing with Byron Young like that kind of mindset is with Kobe Turner there's a lot of potential there there's a lot of upside and if he can get the right coaching be around the right people you know he could reach a new peak and this could be one of their you know under I mean I know they might may have taken him a little early for people but this might be when we look back this might be one of their gems I mean I remember when they took you know Franklin Myers in the fourth round and everyone's like that was really early and they actually found a gem they just didn't hold on to him Um, so when it comes to, you know, Turner, he's going to be in that room. He's going to have a chance to compete. I mean, you know, you have Marquise Copeland, you you have, you know, Jonah Williams, um, you know, Bobby Brown, the third, he's going to have a chance to compete. And let's be honest here. He was picked one round higher than Bobby Brown was. So that's something to keep in mind, uh, moving forward. You know, I think that that round selection was very interesting because I don't think a lot of people took the interior defensive line as seriously as the Rams did. I don't think they looked at it as like, Oh, we need to get a third rounder day two guy. I think they were looking more eh, fifth round. You get a guy in there, you know, has a chance to compete. They've also done such a nice job with like UDFAs. I mean, if you think about Hoyt, who is now an outside linebacker, 
Hoyt was a UDFA. Williams was a UDFA. Copeland was a UDFA. You know, Lorel Murchison was just a guy that they basically claimed off waivers after the Titans cut him, a uh, former fifth round pick. So, you know, I think they've done a nice job of finding, um, you know, talent outside of the building. And I think that's why a lot of people were like a little surprised by this pick and where it was. But no, I think it was a, it was a good pick. And then, um, you know, round four, certainly uh, the most polarizing pick of, of the entire draft, I would say, for the, for the Rams. I mean, I think Stetson Bennett is a love him, you hate him type of guy. I think he's somebody that has a lot of fans, kind of similar to when Baker Mayfield became a Ram. Um, but I also think there are a lot of people that do not like him. I think there are a lot of people that watched him at Georgia and give you know all the credit towards you know his supporting cast. And I think there's something to be said in between a lot of that where, yes, he played on a team with a lot of talent. They won two national titles. Obviously, you have to have talent to do that. But at the same time, he had to make those throws. And we've seen quarterbacks who haven't gotten that done on the level he did. And I think while everyone's trying to kind of compare him to Jake Fromm, Alexis, I would say he's a lot better than Fromm. And I don't think he is. He's being somewhat underrated, I think. I had him as a fourth round grade, like I said, in the draft. Um, that does not mean he comes in right away. I saw, I saw a comment out there. I think he has a chance to push Matthew Stafford. Like, no, no, no. Matthew Stafford won a Super Bowl in the NFL. And unless he gets hurt, I don't think Stetson sees the field. But the Rams did just go out and add Brett Rippon. And I think he'll win that battle. I think that's fair to say. Yeah. Um, I This is the only pick that I... This was my least favorite pick of the Rams drafts. Anybody who watched the live stream knows that um, he does have a vicious crowd of fanboys that did come for me. Um, I'm oh, still yeah. alive. I'm still breathing. <laughs> so um, they can't be that bad. Um, but the thing with Stetson Bennett, I I had him graded as like a sixth to seventh round pick. And by the way, guys, I know everyone everyone who was were clip warriors and just wanted to Google Stetson Bennett and came or YouTube Stetson Bennett and came across our clips. Like people are probably gonna do with this as well. Um and watch my analysis uh on Stetson Bennett. I'm actually in the majority um in that thinking, by the way. If you wanna go look up actual scouting reports from NFL scouts that you can read online, um I was in the majority in that camp. So I wasn't saying anything crazy by saying that Stetson Bennett was projected to be a late round pick. I do fall into the category that he had a really good supporting cast at Georgia. I don't really think when you watch Stetson Bennett, it's anything that he's doing um, that was leading them to those championship wins. Now there is something to be said for winning. So I can't knock him for that. I do give him, you know, the credit. I mean, not anybody can just, go win two national championships. I think that he has a lot of confidence. He will make the big play. He's not afraid to. And I think that that's what you need um, to be, a, you know, a winning quarterback in the NFL, certainly. Um, but other than, you know, the obvious appeal of the national championships, I mean, I think he's got pretty good accuracy. Um, he's not afraid to use his legs. Um, he sees the field, you know, pretty well, I'd say better than average uh, for, uh, you know, most quarterbacks in college. I mean, I think that he he's um, he doesn't struggle to, you know, read the field at all. But I think the thing with him um, is he lacks arm strength. You know, he doesn't really have that good of an arm. A lot of people don't like that, but it's just true. That is on most scouting reports. Um, he's not very accurate um, with a deep ball. Um, as well and he also holds on to the ball really long that was something I think that in college was kind of like his biggest enemy um, was beating himself by just holding on to the ball too long so that might be a decisiveness issue he certainly had a good offensive line so I wouldn't say it was because of the offensive line um, the personality hit or miss like Jake said I think some people really like that um, mentality kind of that in your face super confident um type of thing and it bothers a lot of people. So um, yeah, I, I don't want to get too crazy because the clip warriors who think that they're big <laughs> and bad on YouTube are going to come for me. Um, and I just, I'm not going to deal with it. Deal I, with yeah. I, I will say like you and I absolutely disagree with that pick and that's okay. I think, you know, 
here's the thing that this show doesn't really become watchable if we agree on everything. And I think that's the thing that people forget is that you and I both have separate opinions. <laughs> we're not, uh, we're not told by higher up. So this is what you have to say. You have to create this narrative. We've been, we haven't been afraid to, to speak out about the team. I spoke out about the off season and said, I didn't like it. I really like the draft. Um, this is one of those picks where I think, you know, you and I were kind of in agreement on the first three we kind of veer off a little bit here and that's fine. I mean, personally, I think, you know, watching Bennett's tape, I wasn't expecting, like when I dove into it and I kept the tweet up, Alexis, I had said in January, this is another college quarterback. You know, I thought I got like the vibe of like, I I don't know, like Tebow, like some, you know, kind of that realm where I never thought Tebow was an NFL quarterback. I, I never thought that. Um, the fact he got drafted in the first round literally blew my mind. Christian Hackenberg. I said he was undraftable. He goes in the second round, never plays a game in the NFL. But there was something about watching Bennett where I was like, man, I'm going to have to eat my words because I felt, and, and I've said it on this show like a while ago. Remember, I was like, I think that might get the kid from Georgia. Like, I think it, it might not be his last time playing in SoFi. Um, but I, I think when you you look at Bennett, what impresses me the most are throws that there are quarterbacks in the NFL that can't even make them. Like I noticed the far hash throw to the far sideline. Like there are guys in the NFL that still can't hit that. Like I watched Zach Wilson last year, try to do that and throw pick sixes. You know, Um, I feel like Stetson has enough to work with where you get him with a Zach Robinson, you get him with a Sean McVay, uh, you get him with Matthew Stafford and they're going to create a plan for him, Mike LaFleur. Um, and I think if he has to start for an injured, God forbid Matthew Stafford this year, because assuming he plays all 17 games seems a little delusional in my opinion, I think Stetson can start. I think if Stetson is throwing to Cooper cup, uh, you know, hopefully a resurging, Van Jefferson, who's building off the end of last season, Tutu Atwell, Ben Skoranek, Tyler Higby, Davis Allen, Bryson Hopkins. I mean, I feel like the offensive line is going to be repaired. You have, uh, you know, Cam Akers, Kyron Williams, Zach Evans. Like, to me, there's enough there where I feel confident that Stetson can run the offense. And I think he'll look better than Wolford, in my opinion. Um, and, and I think that, you know, his mobility is real. A lot of the times, you know, in college, it's like, okay, well, he can run, but there's not a lot of fast guys in college, so he looks a lot faster than he is. No, I mean, he ran below a 4.7. So, I mean, that's faster than Carson Wentz. Um, You know, and I remember Carson Wentz looked pretty fast coming out. But, you know, I just think at the end of the day, uh, Alexis, you know, when you look at this pick, it's really going to separate a lot of people. But I think it's important to realize that, like, everyone's entitled to their opinion. And this isn't a pick that just automatically will just work for people because I mean, how many times have we covered the draft? How many times have you and I liked this player and the Rams and went in this direction? How many times have you and I watched quarterbacks? We watched plenty of quarterbacks. Jaron Hall was right there, you know, but then I find out Jaron Hall had his, his shoulder was red flagged. So that might've been the reason, but they, they really like Stetson. I like Stetson. So I'm excited to see what ends up happening there, but I think he's got legit, starting quarterback upside. He doesn't need to be that right away. And so he's in probably the best position to succeed. I'd say the same thing. If it was Will Levis, I'd say the same thing. If it was Hendon hooker, I'd say the same thing. If it was Clayton tune or Aiden O'Connell, you get a chance to sit behind Stafford. I don't care what you bring to the table. You, you don't have any pressure on you as a fourth round pick, not having any pressure on you. That's a good thing. So we disagree on the Stetson pick. Um, but we agree on the next pick, Jake. Um, yes. On Nick Hampton, our fifth round pick, uh, 161st overall, the edge rusher from App State. Jake, what are your thoughts on Nick? You know, this is a, a juicy player, Alexis. I don't mean that in a weird way. He just provides the edge uh, with a little juice off it. You know, he's he's an explosive athlete. A guy he's going to be rocking, I think, 31. That's a really weird number for a uh, pass rusher off the edge, but that's the uh, that's the world we're living in right now. So uh, Nick Hampton is going to be a situational rusher. He needs to work on his uh, run defense, I believe. You know, when I watch the tape, he doesn't really set the edge well, and that's fine. I mean, when you're playing at App State, 
the things that you're doing at that level, if they don't translate at the NFL level and you're a fifth round pick, that's okay. You know, I think this is really good value for the Rams. I had them about a, you know, a late third, early fourth round grade. And, um, you know, I think they got a, a really good pass rusher that has potential to be a starter down the road. He needs to work in run defense though. He needs to work in really fine tuning his craft as a pass rusher. Um, but he can help you right away as a rotational guy. And, you know, it might not be the the best coach to take it away from, but to be fair, he did coach in a Super Bowl. He won a lot of games. Jeff Fisher always said, you know, you can never have too many pass rushers. And I agree with him because in this league, with all the injuries the, the Rams went through last year, you can never have too many anything in this league. So, um, you know, I think Nick Hampton, he'll fit right in there as the third, fourth, or fifth guy, wherever they see him. Uh, Daniel Hardy's still on the roster. Keir Thomas is still on the roster. I think Keir Thomas is more of a, uh, you know, a role player as a guy that can set the edge, stop the run. He's a bigger bodied guy. Then you look at Nick Hampton. He's of the similar vein as a Daniel Hardy. So I think those two are going to be battling it out. Um, I don't think necessarily they'll be battling with Keir Thomas because, like I said, Thomas brings a different skill set. Um, but I love this pick because anytime you go out and you get a guy that can contribute day one in the fifth round, uh, you're cooking with gas. Yeah, Nick Hampton, um, <clears throat> kind of in the in terms of like the athletic specimen uh, pool, very, very much so. I mean, 6'3", 240 pounds. He sumo deadlifts 600 pounds and incline presses 365 pounds. So he's a very strong man. Um, yeah. If you guys weren't aware, uh, just athletic freak. Um, absolutely just insane. Very fun to watch um, in terms of an athlete. Um, again, back to his athleticness. Um, he's very explosive, high motor, start to finish. He's a good tackler. Um, quick. I mean, you just, when you watch him, you can just, those athletic qualities that a lot of other guys don't have, I think really stand out with him. Um, I think like the only knock that some scouts had on him um, was that he needs to find more moves in the pass rush, um, which you kind of alluded to as well as, you know, he's going to have to, I think, take some time to kind of diversify his skill set there. But yeah, I don't think that as much is going to be expected from him day one as like a Byron Young, right? So I think that he has time. He's developmental. But I mean, the athletic traits uh, are there. Yeah, no, they absolutely are. And before we move on to the next player, I didn't want to uh, come off as like I'm disrespecting App State. But just it's the facts when you're playing in college, things that you do, you get away with like body catching as a wide receiver, or maybe you're not that great of a blocker as a tight end, or maybe you don't really run with any vision as a running back. You bounce everything in the outside as an edge defender. You, you have a lot of false steps. You don't have a plan of attack. You just win off pure athleticism because you were simply stronger and faster than everyone else against you. That when you're translating that to the big boys, you're playing in the NFL, the best players in the world at that sport. You need to, you know, improve upon your game. You need to have more refinement. So it's not a knock on Nick Hampton. It's not to say that he's lazy or that app state is a joke. It's more so to remind people that, you know, like you and I have talked about, there is a transitional period from the college ranks to the NFL. And it doesn't matter if it's FCS or FBS. It doesn't matter if it's D2, D1, or D3. There's always going to be that transitional period. And we've seen it, uh, Alexis, with the Rams. I mean, Van Jefferson was a second-round pick, 57th overall in 2020. And he had not even 300 receiving yards his first year. And this is a guy they drafted in the second round. So there's always a chance they redshirt a guy like Nick Hampton or they take their time with these guys. But at the end of the day, they're going to do what, what works best. They're going to get along. Uh, you know, they're going to get these guys in a the room. They're going to figure out what their strengths are, their weaknesses are. Um, because keep in mind what these guys worked on, you know, you see on tape. I mean, the weaknesses, Alexis, they might have already fixed them in, during the pre-draft process. I think that's something we kind of forget. And this next pick is another one that I know we both really liked a lot. Um in the fifth round, just a little bit, one seventy fourth overall, uh, we drafted Warren McClendon, offensive tackle out of Georgia. So he was protecting Stetson Bennett um, while he was at Georgia. So Warren McClendon, big offensive tackle. A lot of scouts actually think he has the versatility to play all three positions on the offensive line. Um, I didn't 
know that and really pick up on that when I was watching his tape, but I don't doubt it um, just because he's, I guess you could kind of see it. Um, But he apparently, you know, a lot of teams felt like he had a really high football IQ and they really liked that out of him. Um, I think he's pretty sturdy. He good with his hands. Um, The only knock on Warren McClendon is that he has kind of heavy feet um, and, you know, he's not super fast. So if he can lose leverage against like faster edge rushers, um, that can be kind of difficult for him. Um, He's not able to really keep up with them. So I don't know that he's starter quality right away. Obviously, if he has to step in, I think he'll be fine. I think he's a lot to work on. And a lot of that just has to do simply um, with the athleticism a little bit, um, whatever he needs to do to kind of be better against the pass rush. Uh, But the talent is there, obviously played on a national winning team. Um, Looked pretty good. You know, if you watch his tape, very solid. Um, I'd say wins more than he loses, but if he can just kind of get down like the feet, just be a little lighter, a little quicker on his feet um, and stand up more against those pass rushers, I think he'll be fine. Yeah. You know, Warren McClendon is somebody that I had highlighted early on in the process is somebody that, I mean, he was my seventh overall offensive tackle in the draft. I thought he was a guy that played at Georgia, but was being treated like he was the small school prospect that no one wanted to talk about. Very similar to Tremaine Ancrum, guy that won uh, big games, played in big games, started at a big program in Clemson, you know, had a lot of really key experience, intelligent, um, but a guy that was, for whatever reason, his tape is rock solid. I mean, it's not, he doesn't have perfect footwork or whatever, but I mean, you know, Ancrum had really good tape and uh, he fell to the later rounds. And so I felt like I was watching the same thing over again with Warren McClendon. I called Warren McClendon, Tremaine Ancrum, um, like a higher end Tremaine Ancrum, where he can play guard, he can play tackle. I think they're going to look at him as a guy that probably kicks in at guard in the depth field. And then over time, Alexis, I think he'll have a chance to replace Havenstein at right tackle. That's what I think. I, I feel like that's what we're looking at. I think this guy has uh, you know, a lot of talent. And, you know, he's physical. I mean, you watch him at the senior bowl in those one-on-ones and he just neutralizes guys with that first punch. And so I think really the issue, like you, you had mentioned, he does have those heavy feet and I think his footwork is wonky. And, um, you know, once he gets that down, like, cause he hasn't had NFL coaching yet. Once he gets that down, he has enough tools where this guy's a future starter in the NFL. So it's another really great pick from the Rams. I thought, and uh, just a very, very high football IQ. You have to have it uh, if you're going to play at Georgia. So I really love this pick. It just really showed me that, you know, okay, we're not afraid to continue to address the offense line. We're not afraid to pick a guy maybe around earlier than some teams would have picked him. Uh, we're just going to go out and get a guy that's, you know, won big games, played in big games, gone against big competition, and has some fil- familiarity uh, with the uh, quarterback that we're drafting to be our backup. That doesn't hurt either. And Jake, the next pick was literally the next pick. Um, yeah. <laughs> Davis Allen was 174th overall. The next pick was, or sorry, not Davis Allen. I just ruined that. <laughs> Warren McClendon was the 174th overall pick. Then Davis Allen was the 175th pick. Uh, so back-to-back picks here, quite literally. Uh, Jake, what are your thoughts on Davis Allen? Yes. So I was actually able to break this one, just like the Stetson Bennett one live. That was fun. Um, I love Davis Allen. Okay. Seventh overall tight end, a guy that didn't run well, uh, at 40 time, whatever he plays way faster than a four, eight, four. Um, he had a 91%, com- uh, contested catch rate. So pretty much you throw him up the ball in double coverage or single coverage. He's going to come down with it. I think with Allen, he gives you a guy that you can really develop into your next you know, kind of the future, right? Because you look at Bryson Hopkins, he'll be a free agent after the season. Things might not have gone the way they wanted him, the, wanted that to. And so he might be out after this year, right? He might just sign a deal with somewhere else. And, you know, Tyler Higby will probably be gone after this year. They're both under, uh, you know, in, in their last year of their contract. And then you look at, you know, Hunter Long and you're like, okay, like there, there's some depth in this room. But also I think Davis Allen has the upside uh, I don't care about the 40 time. I think Davis Allen has the upside to be one of the 
best tight ends from this draft. I said it. I was like, I'd rather have Davis Allen in the fifth, sixth round, whatever, wherever he goes over picking Schoonmaker in the second. I like Schoonmaker, but I think the value the Rams got getting Davis Allen in the fifth round was awesome. And this is somebody, Alexis, where had he played with Trevor Lawrence and Deshaun Watson, he's going in the second or third round. But he played with uh, DJ Ugalele or however you say his name. And it just wasn't a great, you know, a great time uh, at Clemson. I mean, they were not a great football team. They were, you know, very underachieving. And it was just not the same team. So I think at the end of the day, when you look at that, that caused Davis Allen to fall. Um, the Rams will scoop him here, get him in the room. Nick Cayley, the new tight ends coach for the Rams, wanted him badly. So that was a big thing there. He really wanted him. He was really hoping for him. So they were able to make this uh, pick. And I think they got a lot better, you know, so far through this part in the draft at 175. I thought they got some guys that can help them down the road, help them for the future. But maybe Davis Allen shocks us and he plays, you know, sooner than later. Yeah, Davis Allen, um, obviously he has kind of the name credibility. He played at Clemson. Um, He is pretty i think with him what's impressive is he can kind of make catches from everywhere like he has a pretty good catch radius so if you can get the ball kind of in his general vicinity he's probably going to make the catch uh he has very soft hands um, i hate that term but that's just a term that people use um so pretty good at, at making all types of catches he's not afraid to block which I think is going to be important for him being on the Rams. Um, he can underrated his, blocker. I'm glad you brought yeah, that up. Blocking tight end um, at the line of scrimmage. He's pretty good at creating separation. I think the thing, like what I've written down with Davis Allen is he lacks speed. I don't, I think that you and I might view the tape. I don't really think that um, he's very fast for a tight end. I don't think it matters because he has those other qualities. Like I said, I think that that's going to just limit kind of how he is used. And then he also, a lot of scouts don't really like his route tree. They said he ran a really limited route tree um, at Clemson, but that's something that can be fixed. I don't, I mean, I get that it's a knock, but um, especially because I don't think that he's going to be expected to start right away. He can go ahead and learn the Rams route tree uh, and diversify um, his portfolio there. So I don't think that's super concerning. I think um, in like, kind of like you said, I don't think it's going to be a huge deal that he's not a quote unquote fast tight end. I don't, that's not how they're going to use him. Um, so yeah. Uh, next fifth round pick, because we have another one. This is our mm-hmm. fourth fifth round pick. Um, it was a guy that I really, really liked. Um, and I actually mocked to the draft, uh, mocked to the Rams a few times uh, when I was doing my mock drafts. Then that's Puka Nakua, fifth round pick, 177th overall, a wide receiver from BYU. And I think what's fun about him um, is, so you actually, we just were talking about routes. He's a very polished route runner, and he's very good at creating separation with defensive backs, which uh, it's an important ability to have as a receiver not all of them have it but pretty much anywhere on the field he's able to create separation and he also has a very reliable hands he does not drop many passes which is also very important and again it's something that should seem obvious when you're talking about wide receivers like they shouldn't drop any of the balls but there are receivers that have problems with that um, especially in college so the fact that that he did not drop hardly any passes at all. Very impressive. He's really good at tracking the ball downfield. You can use him deep. Um, you can use him probably anywhere in the field, but he's very good at tracking the deep ball. Um, and he makes those off balance catches um, kind of like in the, the same way that Davis Allen does. Um, if you can kind of get the ball to Puka just in the general vicinity, he's probably going to catch it. He can make some impressive catches that way. So I really liked this pick. Um, and yeah, I think it was great. And he was like one of the three guys that I actually had going to the Rams in my mocks. So I was happy about that. Yeah. I think Puka is definitely a Rams receiver. You know, I think look at Josh Reynolds when he had to be the high end wide receiver four behind guys like Sammy Watkins, Cooper cup, uh, Robert Woods, Brandon cooks, you know, I thought he did a really nice job of filling in a role, you know, and uh, I think the the thing that was kind of the rude awakening 
for Josh Reynolds is when he realized that size wasn't going to be a factor in the NFL. He wasn't built to really box out defenders and his timing in those jump ball situations just didn't translate the way it did in college. Um, He did struggle with that. So what did Josh Reynolds do? He became more of a finesse possession receiver. I think Puka Nakua is more than just a guy that's just going to go up and get a jump ball though. I mean, when you look at his, you know, hand-eye coordination near the sideline. First off, his sideline awareness is the best in the class, I thought. The guy's always trying to get two feet in bounds, which points to him because I swear to God, like, they need to get rid of the college one foot in bounds rule. It's the most ridiculous thing ever. But um, Nakua always tries to get two feet in bounds. He has a really, really good, uh, you know presence I would say in the red zone um, just a, a really good feel in the red zone does a really nice job of attacking uh, you know certain leverage you know in coverage and you know I think when you you look at him he's a good route runner that can help you also as you know a little bit of a gadget guy can take those jet sweeps can make things happen I know people were calling him kind of similar to Robert Woods and Debo Samuel I don't think that's fair I, I see more Josh Reynolds in his game um, you know, obviously he's not six three; he's more six one. But you know, this is somebody that's really intelligent. He was a captain at wide receiver, which you don't normally see a number C. Uh, you don't see a letter C on a, a wide receiver uniform. But uh, all in all, I like this pick. This felt very Ben Skoranicky, where it was like, all right, this is our type of receiver. Like they have their own archetype. They like you know smart receivers. They like guys that are multifaceted, and that's what Puka Nakua is. Is he? the best receiver in the league? No. Is he the best receiver uh, in college? No. Uh, was he the best receiver on BYU? Yes, he, he absolutely was. And when watching Jaron Hall tape, he's constantly coming down with it. You can constantly see him, just his awareness near the sideline to get his feet in bounds to, you know, use the sideline to his advantage. A lot of ball carriers, they get near the sideline. They kind of run themselves out of bounds. They tackle themselves, if you will. He does a really nice job of using that to his advantage, uh, you know, making a guy miss. And now he can kind of jump back into the middle of the field. Um, he's going to be a fun player to watch. I think he's going to wear number 17, like Robert Woods. And that's going to be a little bit of an adjustment for me. <laughs> uh, when I did my roster, per, like, <clears throat> number predictions i predicted 16 okay so i was one off um but yeah love that pick jake the next pick uh in the sixth round 182nd overall the rams picked travius hodges tomlinson the cornerback from tcu what says you uh major steal probably one of the biggest steals of any team in the nfl draft um travis travis hodges tomlinson i i don't really know what more you could ask for i mean you know, I believe Les Snead picked LaMarcus Joyner, if I'm not mistaken. He had to go up and trade for him in the second round. Here's the thing. Joyner was 5'8", you know, probably about 180. Um, Travis Hodges Tomlinson's 5'8", 5'9", whatever you want to say. I, I think he's more 5'8", even 5'7 and a half. But the point is, like, this is 2023. I mean, there have been guys that have been drafted 5'8", DBs that have been traded up for in the second round. I don't know what this guy has to do to go higher. I mean, he won the Jim Thorpe award that goes to the best cornerback in college football. Um, You know, this is somebody that is in the 90 plus percentile in pretty much every athletic measurement, except for his weight and height, which that's not really an athletic measurement now, is it? So uh, THT day one starter at nickel. I think they have to move to Kobe Durant to the outside. And then I think you have a Darion Kendrick versus um, Robert Rochelle battle on the other side. You know, I think that's what happened here. I think the Rams got a lot better in the sixth round. Not something you normally say, but when you're able to get a guy like THT who has that, you know, Ladanian Tomlinson bloodline um, that that's really impressive to get him at 182. Now he made a mistake. He should have worn 21. Zach Evans will wear 21. It would have been cool to see LT, uh, having that number back on uh, back in the NFL and and having his uh, nephew wearing it on the Rams. I agree. Missed opportunity there, but you know, I think he just probably wants to carve his own path and yeah, do his own can't, thing. Can't so, blame him. So good for him. Um, yeah, I mean, he is one of the most athletic cornerbacks in the draft. I think in terms of explosiveness and agility. Um, he's also very experienced. He played roughly twenty five hundred snaps. For TCU. Yeah. That so guy fell has, in the sixth round. 
yeah, he's very experienced. He's seen it all. So, uh, you know, NFL teams really, really like that. He had 41 passes defended at TCU last year. Got a lot of action. Um, he was he was in the games. And if you guys watch TCU last season, they were very good. Um, they played in the National College Championship. Um, so some of those passes he defended, Jake, are from his now teammate, if I'm not mistaken, Stetson Bennett. Uh, so that's oh, going to be yeah. fun for them to match up in practice. Um, I think with him, he's viewed mostly as a slot corner, but he played outside in college. So I think that that's going to be an interesting challenge uh, for the Rams to decide how kind of what you said earlier, how they want to use him um, with the other corners that they have. The knocks on Hodges Tomlinson are his size, you know, 5'8", 175 pounds. Um, he has smaller arms than you know a lot of the other guys at corners so some teams are a little concerned about that and then they he's a little grabby like he'll get a lot of flags and like fouls he kind of jumps the gun he plays very aggressive which can be very good for a corner but you see a lot of plays with him where he'll he'll kind of you know jump on the receiver and get a little too aggressive and then receivers win the matchup so those are things i think that can be um corrected with the right coaching and just nfl experience um overall i think definitely raw talent that you're going to steal in the sixth i thought that he would go higher um as i think most people probably did um so the fact that he fell the sixth round lucky us say that i think the rams got a steal next sixth round pick jake 189th overall, so seven picks uh, later. The Rams drafted their third edge rusher of the 2023 NFL draft. They drafted O'Shawn Mathis, the edge rusher out of Nebraska. Um, he is the most raw, I would say, of the three edge rushers taken by the Rams, which is understandable. He was the last one taken um, in the sixth round. I think that he has all of those athletic traits maybe you know not as flashy as like a byron young that the other two um have he's really great body control it takes a lot to kind of throw him off you don't really see him um get thrown off balance um he's got really good spin moves it was funny because i was looking at like reports on him and like multiple scouts were like very impressed with his spin move like they were like this is like one of the best spin moves that we've seen in this class so that's kind of his claim to fame, I'd say, in the scouting process. Um, I think his only real knock is that he is just so raw. Like, he's not obviously, you know, a day one starter. I think he is going to take time to develop. But I think that was kind of the Rams' intention of taking him in the sixth round is they see a guy who they think has a lot of potential, and they're like, you know what? We've already taken two edge rushers that, you know, will play over him. Let's grab this guy and develop him for a couple seasons and see what happens. Yeah, I, I really like that pick just because of that. You know, um, O'Shawn is not somebody I was able to finish his, uh, you know, his evaluation before the draft, but I did get a chance to watch his TCU tape. I didn't watch his Nebraska tape. And then after the draft, I watched his Nebraska tape and I could see why they draft him. They draft him because they're like, hey, that guy that's playing at TCU, we want that because that guy can play. And I think really the, it's important here. Context is near Nebraska was kind of just a, a huge mess. You know what I mean? Um, they were trying to, and I've, I've said this now multiple times, but they were literally trying to recruit Kansas's coach, uh, Lance Leipold, like the entire season. So they were all over the place. Right. And I just feel at the end of the day, Oh, Sean Mathis probably should have stayed at TCU. He probably shouldn't have transferred, but you know, he thought this was a good opportunity for him. And unfortunately, it just didn't work out the way he probably intended. He's a, you know, 6'5", 250 pounder, vines for arms, NFL.com uh, said. I, I noticed that. But, you know, I think really what it comes down to is this is who you get in round six. You're not supposed to find Travis Hodges Tomlinson in round six. You're not supposed to find NFL ready guys. You're supposed to find guys like this. You pick O'Shawn Mathis. You, this is a lottery ticket, as Lance Erline said on you know NFL Network. Like, look, the Rams are drafting this guy's a lottery ticket in two to three years. He might end up being something, you know, but right now he's probably, I mean, he might see some time on the team, but I'm honestly expecting him to be a practice squad guy because I think this is a guy that you'll be able to kind of sneak onto your practice squad, develop him, keep him in the, the building. And uh, yeah, I think two to three years, you could be looking at something. Now, the problem with that 
is that two to three years from now, it's going to be almost at the end of his contract. So, you know, it's, it's kind of, it goes, it goes both ways. Right. So I think Oshawn, he has a good support system. He has a good organization. He's going to for pass rushers. Obviously we've seen plenty of pass rushers succeed uh, for the Rams. So um, I like this pick for that reason alone. But then when you watch this TCU, uh, TCU tape, Alexis, you can definitely see why they chose him. And with our last pick in the sixth round, Jake, the Rams took a running back, which uh, this was late for a lot of people. A lot of people thought that the Rams were going to take a running back higher. And I said, they, I didn't think so. I didn't think that running back for the Rams was as big of a need that a lot of people made it out to be. Um, I think that they like acres. I think that they like Kyron Williams. Um, I didn't think that they were going to go take a running back in the second or third round. I just didn't. Uh, so they finally took a running back in the sixth round. They took Zach Evans running back out of Ole Miss 215th overall. Jake, what do you think about Zach? Yeah. So we talk about another TCU transfer here, Zach Evans. Uh, he goes to Ole Miss and he's expected to be the starter. Unfortunately, he does lose his starting job. I finally remembered his first name. I keep saying Judkins. Well, it's Quinshawn Judkins and keep the name in mind because he's probably going to be a top pick uh, at some point whenever he comes out. But Evans to me, I can I, you know, compared him to uh, Dalvin Cook. You know, I see the speed. I see the power combination. Uh, he's a little bit bigger than Dalvin Cook, I would say, but um, they're actually, it's funny. There's a lot of people that are comparing him to Cam Akers, which is hilarious because he's going to be going in that same room. And what I'm hearing, Alexis, is that they like Kyron Williams as the, uh, the running back that's going to be there on third down. He's going to be a reliable pass protector. He's going to be a receiving threat and uh, potentially change of pace. But Zach Evans has a chance to win that starting job post Cam Akers. And so they felt like, they had something here when he fell to pick 215. They traded up to go and get him, just like they did with Kyron last year. They traded up in the fifth round. They go up and they trade for another running back in, in Zach Evans. And this is somebody I had a late second round grade on. Um, I think he fell because we've heard about maturity issues and maybe there were some <clears throat> some medical stuff as well that were, was thrown in there. But I think he fell because teams were really concerned about his maturity issues. And when you get to the sixth round, it's like, who gives, you know, who really cares at the end of the day, the Rams had four, six round picks or the three, six round picks. I mean, at the end of the day, they're, they're not going to care. They also had three seventh rounds. So they fell at this point in the draft. This is the time where a team can just go out and get a guy like Zach Evans. And they're like, you know what? We're going to just, <clears throat> we're just going to trade up and get him. And I think, he offers that home run hitting ability that's not currently on the roster. I think Kyron had it in college, but that speed is not home run hitting in the NFL. I think Cam Akers had it in college. That speed is not home run hitting in the NFL. But I think the irony is that Cam Akers ran a 447, and I think Zach Evans 45. Um, uh, you know, whatever he ran the the 45, I think his tape shows that he has more explosiveness. And I think that's a big issue there for teams because when you're able to, you know, explode out of the gate, like, you know, you're, you're going off the rock and roller coaster or whatever, zero to 60, you already have that advantage. You're already in the second level. It's about maintaining that long speed. And that's something Zach Evans has. Now the, the question marks with Evans and you're getting a running back in the sixth round, so it's not going to be perfect, but uh, the question marks with him, even if he went in the second vision, right? He's got some inconsistent vision. You know, he'll, he'll be great in some cases. Others, he really likes to bounce it outside. So you're getting a running back that might be a little one-dimensional as of right now. But I think if they coach him up, they get him under the hood. Ron Gold can really work on him. And I think he's going to play a little bit this year. Uh, number 21, Zach Evans, Alexis. I, I really believe that. Um, and I think he's got a future to potentially be the starting Rams running back down the road. But that might be way down the road. I don't know. Um, they just really are, they're feeling great about this pick. Yeah. So what I have down for Zach Evans is kind of like you said, the home run hitter, quick burst, top end speed. So he, he kind of like, he, they brought him in to be the punch. Like, I think he's a very situational running back, at least for now in that sense. I think that he complements the other two running backs that we have uh, in that way. He has that home run speed that they don't. 
the concerns about Zach Evans, like you said, the maturity thing, um, a lot of teams were um, have a bad taste in their mouth with him about that. And then he, his vision, I wrote, he can get confused and doesn't react to changes in the defensive front. So he does panic a lot, doesn't have those quick eyes. So he'll get the ball. He's not really sure what to do. He'll try to bounce outside or he'll get tackled for a loss or, you know, he just, he's not quite sure. It's the vision which we've seen in other running backs um, in the NFL vision issues. He also had a really high fumble rate in college. Now, is that something, sometimes that's something that can go away when you go to the NFL. It's a mental thing um, for the most part, I think. So I don't, I'm not super concerned about it, but that was, you know, a lot of scouts wrote down that they were concerned by his high fumble rate. But yeah, I think that the Rams, like you said, they were in the sixth round and I think that they had enough picks where they were like, you know what? We see potential here. Why not? If it doesn't work out and all all of these knocks against him prove to be valid, then it doesn't work out. But, you know, we took him in the sixth round. It's, we're not making a super high investment in him. So um, the next pick, Jake, is another Evans. Uh, they took back-to-back Evans. Um, if only Bobby Evans was still on the team, we'd have an <laughs> Evans trio. Um, but he is not, uh, thankfully. But the Rams in the seventh round... 223rd overall, they took punter Ethan Evans uh, out of Wingate. And I believe that he is the only punter the Rams have drafted, at least in recent memory, because Johnny Hecker was not drafted. Johnny Hecker was a UDFA. Um, yeah. and, and the punters that we've had, you know, the few punters that we've had since Johnny Hecker were also um, free agent signings. So, Jake, I. I'm not going to lie. Anybody who pretends, I don't want to say pretends, but most people are not able to put together a comprehensive scouting report on a punter if they haven't been a punter themselves. It's one of those positions that it's like kind of hard sometimes. Like you you can look at a few things, but it's it's hard. It's just harder to grade. Um, but I looking at other people's reports um, on Ethan Evans, it's, he has pretty good leg strength. Um, that stands out. 50% of his punts were within the 20 yard line. So that's a pretty good stat for a punter. And he played all four years in college. So he had a lot of experience um, playing against good teams. Um, so that's what I have. I was actually not upset about this pick. I know people thought that I was because I made a comment about like, oh, we drafted a punter. But I kind of am like of the position, and I know that you are as well. Like sometimes it's like okay to take kickers and punters as UDFAs. Um, yeah, I do which think, they however, did. Um, right, they did. They did end up taking a kicker or two kickers actually. Um, as and UDFAs. a long snapper. But I think again, like what we were saying with Zach Evans, I think the Rams were in a position where they had so many draft picks. It's like if there's a punter that you really like, like why not? take him so nobody else can take him. So I think that that's what they did with Ethan Evans. Jake, what are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are that special teams coordinator, uh, Chase Blackburn did a really nice job in finding him. Um, You know, just watching Sean McVay talk about him. They're like, oh yeah, you took a punter. And and he and Les are like, we didn't take him. (laughs) It was uh, Chase Blackburn. Like he's the one who apparently flew out to, uh, you know, Carolina, wherever. I, I don't know if it was North or South Carolina for Wingate, but um you know, he was with the Carolina Panthers. So I wonder if those connections he used to, to find this guy, you know, and I I think what it comes down to is that, you know, Ethan Evans has a 70 yard leg. Uh, He's somebody that can help you on the kickoff because, you know, the big reason why, you know, um, Dunn, Christopher Dunn wasn't drafted. And I think we touched on this, on that question uh, on the live stream, Christopher Dunn doesn't have the leg to, uh, consistently hit touchbacks at the next level. And if you can't do that as a kicker, you're not getting drafted. So the Rams get him undrafted. They go reverse, you know, Johnny Hecker, uh, Greg Zerline. They instead draft the punter and get the UDFA kicker. And I think this is going to work out for them. Uh, like I said, Ethan Evans is a guy that they really liked and they're able to, you know, get one of those extra picks and they use it on him. And, you know, he's going to help you on the uh, the kickoff. He's going to be wearing number 42, which a lot of people have issues with that. I'll just say this right now. Expect more 40s for 
specialists because now that you have these single digit numbers going to linebackers and wide receivers and so forth, there's just like those guys aren't going to get their their way. You know what I mean? So uh, 42 is not a shock to me. Um, he is related to Heath Evans, who played in the NFL with the Patriots. I did find that out. So uh, I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, some more NFL bloodlines there. But I like the pick, Alexis. I just think, and, and I totally understand people are watching our live stream for seven hours. And most of the people that are watching it just want to see our reactions to the, the Ram stuff. So I totally understand. Uh, some people want to see more out of us with he- Ethan Evans. But I don't think you and I thought they were going to draft a punter. And I actually think, at least for me, I don't want to speak for you, but I thought they might go with another vet. So uh, I didn't like go all out with punter. Like if you wanted like really good uh, punter coverage, that was last year. Alexis and I went all out. We found the Rams two punters, uh, probably more than that. And one of them ended up being the re- the guy that we really wanted that we settled on was Ryan Stonehouse out of Colorado State. We interviewed him. Loved the way he interviewed. Then I actually watched his tape. And uh, I got to tell you, like, I had a feeling, you had a feeling, he ended up being a pro bowler. But that was last year. We really focused on punter, and they went out and got Riley Dixon to kind of nullify all of that. But this year, they go with the uh, the rookie punter. They get him out of Wingate in the seventh round. I like the pick. I wish I knew more about him in the, the heat of the moment. But to be honest with you, I didn't, and I didn't have enough time to to watch it. So after the fact, watching it, you know, watching whatever I could find on Ethan Evans on YouTube, I felt pretty good about the the player that they got, the punter that they got, and the guy that I believe will be, uh, you know, kicking off uh, the kickoffs because that's also a key thing in the NFL. Next seventh round pick, Jake, uh, we have Jason Taylor the uh, second safety out of Oklahoma State, uh, who I really like. But I'll let you go first. What are your thoughts? I see Ronnie McLeod and I see Nick Scott in this guy. I see the tenacity of Nick Scott and I see just the consistent, you know, the hardworking, you know, 110 mile an hour type of guy that Ronnie McLeod was. And McLeod was a UDFA out of Virginia. Nick Scott was a late round pick out of Penn state in 2019. He's now on the Bengals. Jason Taylor II is going to play on special teams. Um, you know, doing the the show with Cam, his, his, him describing as a former Ram that played on special teams, he said every single snap on special teams is like a car crash. It's just constant car crashes. And so you have to be built to play on that, right? Jason Taylor is like a car crash in itself. So, you know, I think Jason Taylor is going to be ready for this. Um, and, and I think he's somebody down the road post Jordan Fuller, whoever, I think he can work his way into being a starter. And I think the Rams obviously would love that in the seventh round. They're not expecting that they're drafting him to be a core special teamer with some potential to be a starter down the road. And I think he's going to be a core special teamer. I think he'll make the team. I feel pretty good about him. Um, <clears throat> I think he's ready to go on special teams day one. Yeah, I think with, Jason Taylor, you have that kind of what we talked about with some of the picks earlier, that like potential where I think the Rams drafted for potential. He's not going to get much playing time right away. He's going to be a special teams guy. But with Jason, what you have is he's very quick. He's very athletic, quick feet, strong hands, um, hard hitter. Um, He's really good at tracking the ball for a defensive back, but that hard hitting can sometimes be uh, what gets him in trouble. Like, a big knock on him was just, he draws a lot of flags. He sometimes just makes like the dumb play, which, you know, everybody makes every once in a while, but some people more than others. Um, And also he gives a lot of cushion um, at times. So if he's not making that hit that he's confident in, he's very hesitant and he'll give a lot of cushion. So I think there's a lot of things that the Rams need to work on with him. um, If he wants to eventually, you know, be playing safety um, in games for the Rams, but like you said, I don't really think that he was drafted for that uh, right away. I think he's going to be a special teams player. And Jake, that leads us into Mr. Irrelevant. The last pick of the Rams draft, 259th overall in the seventh round, the infamous Mr. Irrelevant of the 2023 NFL draft. The Rams drafted Deswan Johnson, defensive tackle out of Toledo. 
Um, and I actually did not know who this was. Um, regrettably, when they made the pick, Jake, you did know who who um, he was. But it's one of my guys. After, after watching, you know, some of his tape, you know, notes that I have, he's very strong. Um, great balance, great burst, those qualities. Um, violent hands is what I wrote down. Um, that's something I think that you can notice with like defensive tackles is just like very angry hands, which they should have. Um, he is also dubbed quote unquote undersized Jake, if you can believe it, um, that we're still here in 2023. Um, that's kind of, you know, if you look at other people's scattering reports of him, they use that as a knock. I don't really think it matters. Um, they say that, you know, the short arms give him trouble rushing off the edge, maybe a little bit. Um, maybe it's something he can work on, but call me crazy. I think that they're going to give him the time to work on these things. He was the 14th pick in the draft. He was picked 259th overall. I don't think that they're expecting him to be starting day one. But again, we talk about this potential and drafting for potential. I think the Rams think that he has all the tools um, to succeed um, in the NFL. So that's why they took him. But um, I ended up liking this pick a lot uh, once I looked into him. Jake, what were your thoughts? Same here. I mean, I he was one of the guys that I think I had done three videos on. Uh, he was one of my guys. You know, when I watched him <clears throat> at Toledo, I just saw that lightning quick first step that just, it kind of gives you an Aaron Donald feel. Obviously, he's nothing like Aaron Donald, but, um, and, and I wouldn't say, because the thing about Donald is he had the bulk. I think that's what's lacking with Deswan and what led to him falling to the seventh round. But I mean, I had him ahead of, uh, you know, a lot of the defensive tackles that went third fourth round i mean i had him as i believe a fourth round grade i really 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 like him and i was just i kept saying in those videos i was like look get this guy in the same room with aaron donald and just just watch because i know people have issues with his bulk they have issues with how much weight he can truly add uh to his frame is he tapped out um but that quick first step the lightning quick first step there are super athletes. There are incredible players in the NFL that don't have that. So, I mean, that's, it's very rare that you have a quick first step like that, where your get off is like, you're already in the backfield and everyone else behind you. If you were to stop it, uh, just completely stop the, the tape, there are guys still not even out of their stance yet. That's ridiculous. And so he has a lot of those plays where I feel like he just, you know, he gets such a great break and uh, you know, his get off is incredible. And, you know, I think this is one of those guys where, you know, you saw Brock Purdy last year as, you know, Mr. Irrelevant. Uh, the Rams have had two Mr. Relevance in their history. Dave Vibora in 2008, um, you know, being the most notable one, but you know, I think this is a guy that can really make a name for himself. Um, I'm not saying he'll start day one, but I'm saying that I think all in all, Alexis, this draft is going to be a blast to watch in preseason. I think this is going to be a lot of fun to see these guys in action. Um, I'm very excited for that. And I'm not ruling out that any of these, you know, you know, slower, um, you know, maybe the potentials there, but not as high a floor. I'm not ruling out that any of these guys can't carve out a starting role sooner than later. I mean, even O'Shawn Mathis, it just takes a really good preseason to get yourself on the map. I mean, just look at what ended up happening with, uh, you know, Lance McCutcheon. I mean, he wasn't even supposed to make the roster. They got him on a team with, you know, full of wide receivers and he made the team. He forced their hand. These guys can force the Rams hand uh, in not only making the roster, but then giving them an opportunity, giving them a role and I think Deswan Johnson, as uh, Mr. Relevant, he's going to make the team. I do believe that. I think he's going to make the team. I think he's going to add uh, some increased depth for that defensive line room. And uh, maybe someday he becomes a starter. But I'm not betting against that guy, especially that he's in the best situation possible with someone who knows what it's like to be underrated, undersized, all of that. You know, And I think him with Aaron Donald, that is going to be a storyline to watch all of training camp, preseason, and so forth. And this leads to the moment that everyone was waiting for. Or they weren't, but we're going to do or, this anyway. Or they skipped um, it because <laughs> it's been they, over an hour. <laughs> yeah, so we'll, we're going to do this really quickly because I think that you and I kind of gave our analysis pretty much in depth mm -hmm. just 
saying what we thought of the picks and everything, but overall grades. Um, and I'm going to pull up a Twitter poll, by the way. Um, because Are you my, now? <laughs> my spoiler, if you watch the streams, um, my grade of this draft is the exact same from the stream, by the way. I It did not change when I went and watched the tape and all this, I, my grade is the same. So I personally rated this Rams draft, which again, these ratings are silly because it's like, we're basing it like grading based on paper, right? Because we're not mm-hmm. going to know probably for a couple of seasons, how this, how drafts really play out, but based on paper, I graded this as a B plus Jake. Um, a lot of people thought I didn't like the draft because I didn't like every single pick because people can't, grow up apparently um but i graded this a b plus uh again for everyone on youtube who thought i hated the draft i also took a twitter poll by the way during our live stream the consensus was also b plus um so if you didn't watch the live stream what i was saying was no different than everyone um in the stream then i took a twitter poll i sent it out to rams twitter in total got around 300 votes um from the rams twitter community And I asked them what their grade was, uh, the draft. And 50% said between B and B plus. 41% had between A and A plus. And then 9%, you know, C to F. Um, So 50%. So is a big chunk, obviously, um, of B plus. And the reason that I am giving the the Rams this B plus grade is I thought they did a pretty good job um, addressing needs in terms of position. Um, A few of those picks I thought were high and I thought there were other guys available. Something I think like you have to look at when there's a draft who's available at that time, because it's always easy in the seventh round to be like, Oh, well, you know, all of these guys are gone. We're going to make this pick. And then that becomes a really good value pick. But I thought the Rams were almost in a way too early making some of those value picks. And again, it's probably just because they just really like those guys. I just didn't prefer it. So it was hard for me. I just, I didn't think every single pick there obviously was a couple, including the Stetson Bennett pick that I just didn't like. So, you know, I think B plus is a fair grade. Um, It's with the consensus as well. And it's also I think one of their better drafts that they've had since 2017. I mean, Jake, you and I have been doing the show for four years. This was our, what, fourth live stream? Yeah. Uh, And we have seen some not good drafts. And I do not classify this as one of those. I mean, we have gone through the roller coaster of emotions um, during our live streams. So this was a very good draft, uh, in my opinion. Um, But Jake... What is your overall grade and quick recap of this 2023 Rams NFL draft? Yeah. So, I mean, keep in mind going into this, the off season was complete failure. Um, Really didn't like the direction they were going in. And I kind of, it's not that I had no hope. It's just like, and I still thought they would win like at least seven games or whatever. Um, It's just like, I felt like they were like wasting years of Matthew Stafford, Cooper Cup, and Aaron Donald's career. And so going into this draft, that's how I felt. Now coming out of this draft, I see the vision. Um, you know, one source in the Rams organization uh, that didn't obviously make the picks, but, you know, knew about them, was part of them, I guess, said it was very calculated. You know, they took a calculated approach. They had a plan. They went in. They had certain archetypes they wanted to fill. They had certain things and criteria that they they needed um, the Rams essentially went into this draft and they created a filter, right? So they have a filter just like, you know, you're, you're going through whatever, like, you know, on iTunes or whatever, you're trying to filter out your favorite albums and you go by five star ratings. And then you go by every album that was in 2022, whatever they had the filter. Their filter was guys that were hardworking. There were a filter of guys that were leaders, guys that had captains, uh, that that were captains, uh, had that experience, um, guys that had been through adversity, guys that were going to make this team better, uh, you know, today and tomorrow. And so I think that's what the Rams did. They accomplished their goals in doing so. They brought in the next generation of Rams football. Um, I know that sounds kind of crazy to admit, but there's a chance Stetson Bennett could be the quarterback of the future. 
Uh, but there's no chance at all that Steve Avila won't be starting day one uh, because that is who he is. You know, there's no chance at all that Byron Young isn't going to be starting day one. Kobe Turner, there's a pretty darn good chance he's going to be starting day one. Nick Hampton, probably going to be in that rotation. Warren McClendon in the rotation. Davis Allen, rotation. Puka Nakua, rotation. Travis Hodges Tomlinson, you're talking about day one starter at nickel. Zach Evans, rotation. Ethan Evans, starter. Jason Taylor, rotation special teams des one johnson rotation and oshaw mathis potentially rotation but could also be just a guy that they they hold on to on the practice squad so you have 14 picks you didn't really uh you know th- there were some guys that you missed on i thought like Adebare to me would have been just unbelievable but i get it there were certain guys they wanted there are certain guys they liked that didn't fit their criteria but they almost considered them and Keep in mind, we started the draft, Alexis, and they wanted to trade up to get Dalton Kincaid. They liked Miles Murphy. They were unable to trade in the first round. You and I looked at that as a good thing because that means that they didn't give up three picks. If they gave up three picks, this draft class changes vastly, and I probably give it a different grade. They also wanted Marte Mapu, as I reported during the draft, at 69. Uh, they decided to trade down. They miss out on Mapu. That that's a shame. The Patriots took him, but now they get Byron Young, Kobe Turner, and they they figure it out. And with you know that trade down, they're able to get Stetson Bennett, who was number one on their board uh, after uh, day two. So you know, all in all, this is an A plus for me. Um, I don't normally give the Rams this high of a grade. I don't think I've ever given the Rams this high of a grade because you and I have been kind of iffy on some of the picks that they've made over the years. But this was one of those drafts where it was like everybody that I was fine selecting or wanted they selected um i talked you know extensively throughout the draft process about byron young and how he would fit the team and how you know just what he's been through steve avila is just a plug-in play you know he has a chance to be an all pro but he's a plug-in play you know kobe turner was maybe not the defensive tackle that i was expecting but they love him they did their research and my guy, uh, you know, who I really admire and I got a chance to talk to at the Senior Bowl, uh, Michael Pierce, one of the Rams scouts on the, the in the South. He's the one that, you know, was behind that, uh, according to reports. So I was really happy for him. If he liked that guy, trust me, I, I believe it. I believe he also was really high into Kobe Durant. So I'll uh, I'll give him his props. Stetson Bennett, to me, that was somebody that I wasn't really expecting um them to take in that moment but it actually makes a lot of sense because now they have a day one backup and they have a guy that could potentially start down the road i love the you know the nick hampton pick you know going out and getting you know just high upside and a guy that maybe could fit right in that rotation i just at the end of the day war mcclendon davis allen travius hodges tomlinson zach evans deswan johnson like they got my guys and i just felt that was really cool because we've done four drafts together when have i said they've gotten that many of my guys so to speak so that's why it was a really great draft in in my opinion i just felt like they got a bunch of guys that i had you know kind of circled guys that could fit this team guys that could have an impact on this team and they found value in places where like if you told anybody before the draft travis hodges tomlinson's gonna go to the rams in the sixth round you would have been like, are you kidding me? There's no way he's going to fall in the sixth round. Or if you told anybody they're going to get Zach Evans in the sixth round, you know, it's just one of those drafts where I think they really got a ton of value. And maybe if they, you know, reached in a certain spot, they made up for it in the back end. So a plus for me, that doesn't mean anything, obviously, because they absolutely have to, to show it on the field. And, uh, you know, we've seen that in the past, but I'm feeling really good about this draft. And at the end of the day, I think that the Rams got better. And I think the Rams are definitely showing you that, look, we're not tanking. We're trying to compete this year. We're getting guys that love football. We're getting guys that can be leaders, that guys that can stay healthy, uh, guys that can play right away. Not everybody, but a decent amount. And uh, we're going to go after this thing. And then maybe 2024, 2025, we're talking the bigger picture. But, you know, we're, we're going to try our best to, to win a Super Bowl this year. And it, it's probably not going to happen, but we're not holding ourselves out of that conversation. And I think that's the thing when you have guys like Sean McVay that are part of your organization. I mean, McVay isn't going to roll over, you know? So I don't know. I thought this draft was, was excellent. Uh, It absolutely accomplished the mission that they were out to, uh, to accomplish. So you don't think they're tanking for Caleb Williams? 
Oh God. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely not. Uh, did you like my video by the way on that? <laughs> I did. Yeah. I, I don't think that the Rams are taking for Caleb Williams. Um, I'm glad that more people are jumping off that ship because for a while on the interwebs, it started to seem like that was the minority opinion. And I was getting nervous that a lot of people bought into that narrative. But I think this draft pretty much proved that they're not. Um, they want to make yeah. a lot of these picks if they were. Um, I think it's silly. I don't think they're going to waste Stafford, Cup, and Donald's last seasons by tanking um and i also don't really like you and i've had this conversation i don't like it when teams tank regardless um i i just think it's unprofessional and ruins it the integrity is. of sports so the rams are not doing that guys um no they're not but in case you were wondering our thoughts on that um, the organization though, like, is laughing behind closed doors though that people think that i i got i'm just saying like from people I've talked to, like they're not, they're not taking like the idea that Sean McVay didn't go. Cause that's the thing, Alexis, if they were tanking, Sean McVay would have taken a year off, you know, Sean McVay would have gone and worked in TV and then come back because there's no way he would want to go through that five and 12 season with all those injuries and then come back and be like, yeah, I'm not going to try to win. No, there's no chance. The only chance of them tanking, that's not from like the Rams. That's just me saying that. Like if the Rams, let's just, you know, let's just give that some air for a second. Okay. The idea that they're tanking, the only way that that could have even been possible is if Sean was out. If he, if he left one, you know, for a year and then came back, but no, they're, they're absolutely not tanking. And Furthermore, it just kind of goes to back to what I was saying in the video while I was wearing a USC hoodie and saying that I think he's the real deal and I really like him. Um, I got to say, like, are we talking about this? You know, if it's if Drake May is a better prospect, are we talking about this with Drake May? No, I think it's uh, whether people want to admit or not, like there's some bias. There's some Pac-12. There's some West Coast bias. If, if there was a quarterback that was better than Caleb Williams in this draft uh, and he was out of Penn State, if he was out of Miami of Ohio, you know, are, are we getting that, that same? No, I, I think it's just, it's very easy to, Oh, well, Caleb Williams was at a Rams game, you know, the, the Rams game where they, they blew out the Broncos. Oh, Caleb Williams is playing in, you know, the former Rams home, right at the Coliseum. Caleb Williams is playing in their backyard. Like it's easy to make those connections, but have we not learned how college football works? We've seen guys who are top prospects, Remember Jake Locker, anybody like Jake Locker was supposed to be the number one overall quarterback. And then he stayed a year and then wasn't drafted number one overall and never became anything. It's not just to crap on Jake Locker, but it's to show you that like Sam Darnold, the same school. I mean, Alexis, I went to the Rams giants game where the Rams won 51 17. Okay. At that game, Giants fans were wearing custom Sam Darnold Giants jerseys. I'm not kidding you. It was suck for Sam. What, where did that go? Like what happened with Sam Darnold right now? He's competing to potentially start in San Francisco. We don't even know if he's going to. So to just assume that 